Okay, so we'll get started. The first goal for today's class is to learn about how to use Lagrange multiplier, well, KKD theorem in particular, because we've already seen an example of Lagrange multiplier theorem. So we'll, we'll talk about how to apply KKD theorem on inequality constrained problems. And then we will uh, move on to algorithms uh, and we'll talk about barrier method for solving optimization problems with inequality constraints. So let's apply KKT theorem. And the idea is if X star is optimal and regular, there exists lambda star mu star such that the first derivative of X star, first derivative of Lagrangian is equal to zero, mu star J equals to zero for all J that are not active. Third is, mu star is greater than or equal to zero. And the fourth one was the second order necessary condition, but we don't really need it for right now. Okay, so these are the three, uh, three things that lambda star and mu star need to satisfy. So let me try to solve this problem. I want to minimize Okay, I want to solve this problem. <coughs> so let's form the Lagrangian x and mu. There is no lambda because there is no equality constraint here. So I'm just going to write the Lagrangian as a function of x and mu and that's f of x plus mu transpose g of x, which is half x square plus <coughs> mu x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus 3. Okay, so the first step always is to write the Lagrangian. And then take the derivative. What is the derivative here? So, x1 plus mu x2 plus mu, x3 plus mu. And so at x star and mu star, they must be <coughs> zero. So I have x1 star equal to x2 star minus mu star. Okay, so how we have four unknowns, x1, x2, x3, and mu, four unknowns. And we have three equations right now on board. So I was able to solve those three equations and get uh, all the values of x1 star, x2 star, and x3 star in terms of mu star. Okay, so now we have one unknown, which is mu star. 
And the question is, how do we solve for mu star? Okay. So what did we do in the equality constraint? Anyone remembers? When there was an equality constraint, we had four equations, four unknowns, right? So, well, not four equations, four unknown, but we had n plus m equations and n plus m unknowns. And the, the way to do what, do solve that problem was get everything in terms of lambda star and then solve h of x star equal to zero, substitute x star with uh, whatever terms using lambda star, and then solve for that equation, you will get the value of lambda star, substitute it back in and you get the values of x star, okay? So that was the case in equality constraint. Now we have inequality constraint, and we have x star in terms of mu star. Now the question is how do we solve for mu star? We don't quite have an equality constraint here to figure out uh, or, or to solve this particular problem and find the value of mu star. So what should we do? Yeah. Single variable optimization. After substituting in the main In the minimization problem, what should I do? So the constraint is inequality constraint. Right. So what's the? Substitute uh, for like reduce it to just the variable that we have. Okay, so we have minus mu star, minus mu star, minus mu star, less than equal to minus three. How do we solve for mu star then? That's the question. That's the same. <laughs> we, are, we are left with the same problem. Okay. Any? The second condition. Okay. So the second condition says if the constraint, if at x star the constraint is not active, then mu star must be equal to zero. Okay. So let's, uh, let's try that idea. So if x1 star plus x2 star plus x3 star is less than negative 3. This implies that mu star must be equal to 0. But what we have is mu star is greater than or equal to 1. Right? So this cannot be true. This cannot be true. So our hypothesis is wrong. Okay? So if this condition holds, then mu star must be 0. But we know that mu star is not zero. Therefore, our hypothesis that this x1 star plus x2 star plus x3 star was less than minus three is wrong. So this implies x1 star plus mu star greater than or equal to one implies x1 star plus x2 star plus x3 star must be equal to minus three. Now, if this is equal to minus three, then that's easy because we have minus 3 mu star equals to minus 3, which means mu star is equal to 1. Okay, so that's how you solve it. Why is mu star 0? That's the second condition. So if the constraint was not active at x star, then the corresponding Lagrange multiplier must be 0. Okay. So this is this is known as the contrapositive statement of this statement. Okay. So this is A implies B, this is not B implies not A. Okay. And this is known as contrapositive statement for this particular statement. So if this statement is not true, then uh, the contrapositive must be true. Yes. Um, so in the constraint we already have less than equal to but when we check the if condition, we wrote only less than. Yeah, because I want to identify whether I'm in this region or whether I'm in this region. Okay? So first I check for this condition, and then I realize that there is some sort of contradiction. Okay? So it means that whatever we are assuming is not correct. So then we move on to the second case where we 
have that this is equal to minus 3, so we are at the constraint set, the constraint is active, then solving the problem is easy because it's the same as equality constraint problem. Okay? So if you had if you had two inequality constraints, then you have to assume one is possible, the other is not, one is active, the other one is not, then the other one is active, but the first one is not. Okay, so you have four such combinations. You'll have to check for all those four combinations and figure out in what case you get a consistent solution. So in this case, for this particular uh, case, we have a consistent solution, so everything is good. But if you have more inequality constraints, then you ha the solution will blow up appropriately. Okay. The so solution is sensitive to what? Changing our constraints. Of course, in this case, because the Lagrange multiplier is positive, so if you move the constraint a little bit, your optimal value is going to change. Yes. Any other question? <clears throat> yes. So there were M inequality constraints, yes. then there will be two to power M possibilities, yes. There will be two raised to M possibilities, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you'll have to check in which case you get a consistent answer. Okay, it must be consistent with these two, these two conditions. Okay, if there are no further questions, I'm going to jump on to barrier method. Okay. <coughs> I want to minimize a function fx. X belongs to a set capital X and gjx is less than or equal to zero for all j one to r. I want to solve that problem. The key idea in barrier method is to create a barrier around the boundary and let the barrier go to zero asymptotically. Okay, so let's say I want to minimize a function that looks something like this uh, in the interval zero to one. I am going to add to this function uh, some other function, let me call it bx. So this is my fx. I'm going to create another function bx that blows up as you go close to zero or as you go close to one, okay? So bx would look something like, something like this, okay? So bx blows up as you get closer to one it blows up as you go closer to zero. Okay, but it remains relatively, it doesn't matter how it behaves in the interior of the set because we are going to multiply bx by epsilon uh, in the iteration. So this is my <coughs> bx and I want to solve minimum fx plus epsilon bx at every point of time. Okay, and I will let this epsilon go to zero as my iterations progress. So this is known as barrier method because you're creating a barrier around the boundary of your problem, of around the inequality constraint. So as the inequality constraint be starts becoming active, you let the barriers go to infinity. Okay, is the idea clear? Yes. You're not really making your loss function convex because it is fx plus epsilon bx, 
So even though Bx may be convex, uh, I, I don't know because that depends on Gjx whether those are convex or not. So even if this is convex, adding a non-convex term may retain the non-convexity because this is only multiplied by epsilon which is a small number. How small is epsilon? So epsilon times Bs is a constant or? Epsilon time Bx will not be constant because epsilon will be let's say 10 raised to minus 3 but Bx goes to infinity. Oh, so it, still goes to infinity. it still goes to infinity. Okay. So no matter how small epsilon you pick, Bx will make sure that as you get closer to the boundary your function goes to infinity. Um, so what should Bx come from? Where does it come from? So we will construct certain barrier functions in some time. Okay. This is the main idea that I wanted to <coughs> propose. Okay. Okay. So in order to be able to construct this barrier function and uh, be able to solve this minimization, we need to make some assumptions. And the assumption is, let S be the set X in capital X such that GJ of X is strictly less than zero for all J in 1 to R. <coughs> okay, so we want S to be non empty. And for every x in capital X, gx less than or equal to 0, there exists a sequence in S such that xn converges to x. So let's look at the first assumption. Uh, many a times, I know many people in the class have asked me this question, if I have x1 plus x2 equals to 2, why can't I write it as x1 plus x2 less than equal to minus 2, no, less than equal to 2, and x1 plus x2 greater than equal to 2. Mathematically, these two things are exactly similar, I mean exactly the same, right? You cannot do this if you're applying barrier method because it requires you to have a point that satisfies all the inequality constraint strictly. Okay? So we want to make sure that our constraint is such that all the points, that there is a point such that all the inequalities are strict at that particular point. Okay, so that's the meaning of S is non-empty. So if you split your equality constraint into two inequality constraints of this form, then that first assumption will not be satisfied. Yes? Why, why are we doing uh, g, j less than or equal to zero? Why can't we do something like constant? Or can we just like transform it to zero? That um, what do you mean, this one? Yeah, yeah. This one. So why can't we say gjx is less than or equal to constant? Yeah, so well, I can redefine my gj to be the previous gj minus c. Right, right. right. So then it doesn't make any difference. Okay. So the interior must be non-empty. The second question is, the second assumption is a little bit more technical. It means that if there is a feasible point, 
in the set that meets the constraint, then there has to be a sequence in this set, capital S, which converges to that particular feasible point. Okay? Now let's look at an example where this is not the case. My set capital X consists of a set and a point, which is away from the set. And I have gj of x, so this is my g1 of x equal to 0. No. This is my g2 of x equal to 0. And everything in the middle is part of the points g1 of x less than equal to 0 and g2 of x less than equal to 0. Okay. So this point is certainly outside of this set, but it is part of capital X. Okay, so this point is part of capital X, and of course this set is part of capital X. What is the set capital S here? Do we have colored chalks? No, we don't. Okay. So the question is, what is my set capital S here? So the capital S is this particular part. Wow, I didn't know I could draw so beautifully. Okay. So that's my capital S. Uh, this point is no longer in capital S. Okay. Because G, G, G2 of X is exactly equal to zero, but not less than zero for this particular point. And if you pick a sequence in S, that sequence will always be within this region, and this point will never be able to reach. You, you, you can never reach this point by looking at a sequence, convergent sequence in this region. Okay? So you want to not have these isolated points that are on the constraint set uh, in, this, uh, in the case where you are applying the barrier method. Okay? So this kind of region should be avoided. So typically what you would assume is your capital X is convex. So if your capital X is convex, you cannot have these isolated points in the, in the, in the set capital X. Okay? So typically Okay, so if you assume X is convex set, then you, don't, you won't have these isolated points and you can use barrier method. So what you're saying is that this isolated point might be the minimum and... That's right. And we are here in the set S and if we are in set S, we cannot reach this. That's minimum. right. That's exactly the point. Uh -huh. What are the circular regions? What do you mean? Uh, this, this area? Yeah. That's outside of the constraint set. So G1 of X is less than zero, so that's in this region, and this is G1 of x greater than 0. So, and the set S won't include the boundary, the G1 of x is equal to 0. Yeah, so this boundary is included. Included? Included in, no, not in S. Not in S. Not in S, but it's included in the feasible region. Okay. So, uh, the set X must be convex. Sorry? Uh, the set X must be convex, or? Not must be convex, but if it is convex, then you don't have such isolated points. So, I mean, consider this particular set where you have two circles and you have G1 of X and G2 of X, okay? Even though it's a non-convex set, so capital X is these two balls, even though it's a non-convex set, you don't have that problem. So all these two conditions, these two conditions are satisfied in that case. Okay. So there's no prerequisite in the original problem that say X must be convex. Yeah, there's no requirement. Of course, in, uh, in real applications, you typically have X, be co X is a convex set, so you don't ever have to worry about this. But you do have to worry about this point, that you should have a point in the set such that GJ of X is strictly less than zero for all J.
Okay, so now the question is, what sort of barrier functions can we construct? So there are two famous barrier functions. Logarithmic barrier function B of X equals to minus summation J equals one to R log of minus GJ of X. These are all natural log. And the second one is inverse barrier function. Yes. In that example that you showed, what exactly did that isolated point represent? <coughs> it's not that what exactly, okay, so let's consider an integer programming problem where the set x consists of only integers, right? Or, uh, so in that case, you have only isolated points. There is no continuum of sets. Because like, one of the questions I have is like, that is not even in the set x, right? No, the isolated point is in the set X and it also satisfies the inequality constraint. Okay. Wasn't uh, like the sphere like the set X? Or no, the set X was the sphere and an isolated point. Okay. Okay. And then you have G1 of X and G2 of X, right? Okay, so these are the two barrier functions. Let's see if uh, it goes to infinity when gj of x is close to zero. So gj of x is negative, and I'm increasing the value of gj of x, getting closer to zero. What is log of zero? Minus infinity, and then I have a negative sign here, so it goes to plus infinity. Okay, so this one is fine. Uh, again, gj of x is going to zero from the negative side. So you have this term goes to infinity, uh, sorry, negative infinity, and you have a negative sign in front, so it becomes plus infinity, okay? So both these barrier functions will blow up to infinity as you get closer to the constraint boundary, okay? Now the algorithm, the uh, barrier method algorithm is pick epsilon naught greater than epsilon one greater than epsilon two going to zero. Compute xk, which is an argument x in capital X, f of x plus epsilon k bx. And the theorem is xk converges to x star. <coughs> or rather, I should write it more formally. If xk converges to x bar, then x bar is optimal. <clears throat> okay. 
Okay, so the idea is clear. I start with some epsilon naught, put the barrier, add the barrier to the function uh, by the factor epsilon naught, and then I'm going to solve this minimization problem over a set. Um, so remember, we've already done optimization over convex set, so let's just assume that our x is a convex set, so you can actually solve this minimization problem. And you get your x naught. Then you have to reduce the value of epsilon. So you go from epsilon naught to epsilon one. And then you resolve this optimization problem. So what do you do with x naught? Yeah. So you're like slowly relaxing it back. Yes. Yes, so initially you use whatever method you, let's say conditional gradient method. Let's say your x is convex, you use conditional gradient method to compute x0 star, uh, or x0. Use x0 as an initial point for computing x1, okay? So start your conditional, so reduce your value of epsilon. Um, start your conditional gradient method with initial value x0, and then after several iterations, you will converse to x1. Again, reduce the value of epsilon. Use x1 as the initial point for running conditional gradient method to compute x2, and so on and so forth. So slowly, you are removing this, well, you're not really removing the barrier because barrier still goes to infinity, but you are reducing, minimize, or reducing the effect of barrier onto the original function, and you will get to the minimum as k goes to infinity. Naturally, in many applications, we don't particularly care whether we get to the optimal point or not. As long as you are close to the optimal point, you are happy, okay? We cannot run the algorithm forever. So as long as we are close to the optimal point, let's say 10 raised to minus 15 away from optimal point, we are happy, okay? We just terminate the optimization. So that's the idea. Running the optimization again and again, and eventually getting to the optimization of the original f of x. Yes. And then solving the optimization. Problem. Right, right. Thereby solving the optimization. So you, it's it's all part of the solution. Okay. Yes. Is x bar the global optimal? Good point. So is x bar the global optimal? So it depends whether you can do the true minimization or local minimization here. So for instance, if these functions were convex then of course uh, you can do global minimization and x bar will be the global minimum. But if this function were not convex, then you can only get a local guarantee, not a global guarantee. So what would be a good uh, example for a function where we should use this method? Because wouldn't this be very computationally expensive to, to ah, That's a good point. So we'll get to, uh, We'll, we'll solve linear programming method with this, with this problem. So you have studied one algorithm which is manifold suboptimization and you're implementing it for linear programming right now. So that's known as simplex method, right? This is the second method for solving linear programs and it is known as a, a interior point method for linear program. So we'll talk about it uh, in today's class, okay? Basically we are <coughs> pushing our starting like guess point as close as possible to the actual optimum before we finally get to just solving f of x. Sorry, I lost the train of, your train of thought, so yeah. You, we pick some random x not first. Yes. Time, right? So is it something like the barrier method is helping us push that yes. uh, initial guess as close as possible to the optimum before we finally That's right. optimize for f of x? Yes, yes. The whole idea is that by solving this problem, I have gotten rid of the constraints completely, okay? So I don't have to worry about these constraints at all and just worry about solving this minimization problem and you already know several algorithms which can be used to solve problems of this type. Uh, in many cases, your, this x could be just Rn, so that's, this is just an unconstrained minimization in that case, okay? All right, any other question? Yes. Uh, no, but if you 
If your iterates are converging, you will know it. <laughs> so in MATLAB, you're implementing your algorithms, right? How do you know that your iterates have converged? Just look at the successive values, like xk plus 1 minus xk. If it is 10 raised to minus 15, it means you have converged. Or if your dk is equal to 0, or close to 0, then you know that you have converged. But here we are sort of doing multiple optimization problems, right? So yes. So every successive optimization problem solution. Right. Like how do we know the next one will not suddenly blow up? Let's, let's talk about it for the linear programming, and you will see how it is done. OK, yes. So is there any constraint that uh, you can apply this barrier method only on a convex sets? No. So how do you check? So, there, so then there is an additional constraint on the set x that it should not have isolated points. Uh, no, that is not the point. I think the point, the, the point is you should be able to solve this problem efficiently. So even if you have isolated point, but you have some algorithm to solve this problem efficiently, you should be good. So I'm talking in the context of barrier methods. Yes. So you gave an example that if you have an isolated point. That is on the boundary. OK. So your assumption 2 <coughs> breaks. If you have an isolated point at the boundary, then the assumption 2 breaks. Right. But so if you have isolated points away from the boundary, then there is no problem. OK? Yes? So if the solution is on the boundary context, Yes. Yes. So if your solution is at the boundary, since barrier function blows up at the boundary, you will never actually get to the boundary. But you can get as close to boundary as you want by picking an appropriate value of epsilon. OK? Oh, that's, that's an easy question to answer. Epsilon k plus 1 equals to epsilon k over 5, or whatever other, fun other value you want to pick. But not too, not too high, not too low. OK? Any other question? OK. So now, what we are going to do is solve linear function over uh, inequality constraint problem over ax equal to b constraint uh, using a log barrier function. OK, and there is some history to it. So this uh, algorithm was first designed in 1984 by a scientist at IBM named Karmarkar. Uh, and IBM went ahead and patented the algorithm because it had very good theoretical properties. Um, and then there were no buyers for that patent. So they lost a lot of money. After seven, I think after 17 or 18 years, the patent expires, so everyone can use it. And then after that, everyone started using interior. Well, I shouldn't say everyone started using, but interior point method became pretty commonplace. So even in MATLAB, if you go to any solver, you will have two options for sure. One is simplex, and the other one is interior. Okay, So you can look at the options for linproc, for instance, and you will have those two options. So it's pretty commonplace now to use interior point method with log barrier function. But uh, back in 1984, it was patented because people thought it will have a huge economic value, but that didn't happen Okay, for some reason. I don't quite know what the reason is. Maybe someone who goes to IBM can send me an email later on telling me what the history there was. You know, there are multiple versions of every historical fact, OK? So I know only one version. <laughs> but there may be others that I'm not aware of. OK, so I want to solve the following problem. I want to minimize C transpose x such that ax is equal to b, x is greater than or equal to 0. OK? <coughs> I'm going to pick barrier function b of x to be the log barrier function. So that's summation log xi i equals 1 to n. So x is in Rn. <clears throat> 
Is this a convex function? It's a fine, so of course it's true. Is this a convex function? Yes. The second derivative is 1 over x, xi square. Summation of 1 over xi square, x is on negative, so therefore it's a convex function. OK. Now, my define my f epsilon of x as c transpose x minus epsilon summation i equals 1 to n log of xi. And this is a convex function. I need to define my set capital X. How should I define it? So I've taken care of the inequality constraint by defining the barrier function. So all I'm left with is the equality constraint and X in Rn. So let's put that in this capital X. Is this a convex set? Ax equal to b, right? This is a convex set. So now I have a minimization problem over a convex set. So we can solve it, okay? We can solve it easily. Yes, so you can use Lagrange. So we just talked about the Lagrange multiplier theorem with inequality constraint. So this is equality, so we are good. This is inequality, so you have two raised to n possibilities for mu star or mu one star, mu two star, and all that. So do you want to go through all the two raised to n possibilities? No, right? So. So yes, even though you can technically use Lagrange multiplier theorem to solve this problem or KKD theorem more generally, you can use KKD theorem to solve this problem. The issue is that you have two raised to n number of possibilities and so you have to go through all the possibilities to make sure that you have a consistent solution. And it's uh, not clear whether you will be able to do that in a reasonable amount of time. Okay. So let's try and uh, let's think about this uh, particular objective function. And what I want you to think about is what happens when epsilon is infinity and what happens when epsilon is zero. Or rather, I should say very close to zero. So let's say this is my constraint set x in x, x greater than or equal to 0. If I pick epsilon to be a very large number, then this term is dominated by this logarithmic term. And if I'm minimizing the logarithmic function over this set, I will get a point somewhere in the middle which I'm going to define by x star infinity. Let me define what x star epsilon is. <coughs> this is my x star epsilon. <coughs> so no matter what is my objective function? Depending on the constraint set, there will be a unique value, x star infinity, so that when epsilon is close to infinity, the optimal solution will be close to x star infinity. Okay? This point has some name.
analytic center. So this is known as analytic center of capital S. Let's say this is my optimal point, x star, for the original optimization problem. So that's equivalent to writing x star 0. That's my optimal point. Uh, as I reduce the value of epsilon, I'm going to trace a path that is going to converse to x star 0 as epsilon goes to 0. And this is known as central path. Okay, so there are two terms corresponding to this linear programming problem. One is analytic center of S, where I take epsilon goes to infinity, minimize minus summation of log subject to Ax equal to B constraint. That gives me this point. And then I let epsilon go to zero, and the optimal points are going to trace. So this would be x star 10, this would be x star 5, x star 3, and so on. Okay? So as you reduce the value of epsilon, the optimal points are going to trace a path. And that path is known as the central path. And our goal is to solve this problem iteratively using, the, using this idea. We want to solve this problem iteratively so that we get closer and closer to x naught star. Okay? As close to x naught star as we want. So my question is, if I ask you, let's say I give you this idea and I ask you that we want to get to x naught star as k goes to infinity, my question to you is, is it required that we follow the central path or can we be in the vicinity of central path and still converse to x naught star? Okay. So the idea, the key insight here in this problem is that we don't have to be on the central path all the time. We can, as long as we are close to central path, we are good. As long as we are making progress in the direction of x naught star, we are good. So the algorithm doesn't solve this minimization problem exactly. Okay? It solves this minimization problem approximately at every point of time. And the algorithm essentially tries to, you start from some, some point far away from x star infinity, you do some gradient descent or Newton step, reach close to x star infinity, then you reduce the value of epsilon. Let's say your epsilon was 15, so you want to get closer to this point, you take another few gradient descent steps, you reach close to x star 15, reduce the value of epsilon to 10, then you take a few steps, get closer to x star 10, and so on. So you're, the path that you are tracing is not exactly the central path, but you are close to central path, and then eventually you get closer and closer to x naught star as k goes to infinity. Okay? So that's the key idea. We don't want to trace the central path exactly as the barrier method requires us to, we want to trace this path approximately and be computationally efficient, in a, in a computationally efficient manner. So I'm going to talk about the details of this method in the next class. Oh, I didn't realize there is a weekend, so have a good weekend. <laughs>